Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Finland Mennonite on YouTube. We're glad you could join us again this morning. We've been working through this sermon series, Jesus Alone, and it's based on the book of John. And we're seeing why Jesus alone is greater than all. We started off where John does by seeing that Jesus is greater than all because Jesus is God himself. Right, The same God that created everything that we see simply by speaking. The same God that holds all things together. Jesus is that God in the flesh. And then we discovered that with a truth this big, we can't just tell people about it. I mean, we surely we want to do that. But we can't just let it stay there. We need to invite them to come and see for themselves this God in the flesh. And last week, Pastor Jerry, he showed us that Jesus alone is the ladder that matters, right? Not the corporate ladder, not the social ladders, not uh, ladders of success or influence, these ladders that maybe get our attention and we think matter. Nope, Jesus alone is the ladder that matters, the ladder that leads to uh, eternal peace, eternal satisfaction, right? No other ladder can do that. So if you missed that message, check back in. To last week's message right the thing about those ladders is all those ladders are work-based right they force us to keep working and to keep to keep moving to keep doing under our abilities but Jesus the ladder that matters he did the work for us and he calls us to believe and obey so in addition to all these today we're gonna see how Jesus alone is the lasting stain remover, right? He's not only the ladder that matters, he's also the lasting stain remover. Now, here's the thing. Not everybody in Jesus' day picked up on this, uh, on this new reality. They somehow missed it. Uh, not only that he was the ladder that matters, but also the lasting stain remover. And sadly, people today still miss this. Here's the question I have, though. Why? Right? How do they, or how? How do they miss this. Well, let's take a look at a verse in Isaiah. Isaiah 43 says this in verses 18 and 19. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. See, if someone's doing a new thing, we can only really appreciate it. We can only really receive it if we let go of the old. So, for example, um, here's a, an oldie but goodie, right? What, what I have here, it's an iPhone. But if you look really closely, this is a really old iPhone, right? Imagine if I said, I, have a, I got a phone for you, uh, you broke yours, and I give you this. I think it's an iPhone 3. Right? Anyone excited to get an iPhone 3 anymore? I mean, they just came, they're coming out with the iPhone 13. So you'd be like, uh, can I even run apps on that thing? Does that thing even make phone calls anymore? Um, I'm not sure that would be overly helpful, right? To still have an iPhone 3. Or, or think about if you're working from home, which a lot of people are now. You're going to college or maybe you're doing some online classes and you say you need a computer. And I say, well, I got a computer for you. And you show up and I, I give you this computer and you're looking at it. You're like, I don't know. Are you sure this is going to do what I need it to? And I say, yeah, absolutely. It's Windows 95. It's an awesome operating system. Like Windows, Windows 95, it's 2021. We talking about Windows 95. Is this thing good enough to run Zoom or run Microsoft Teams and... Does it even have a have a port for internet? Um, right? There'd be a lot of questions if I gave you a computer that could only run Windows 95, that only had the capability and the and the the components to be able to run Windows 95, right? It would probably shut down with some of the new programs. And there's no way you could do Zoom on it. When I think about back in school, uh, I remember subjects like genetics or chemistry, and it was so cute. They would teach you, you know, I got blue eyes, and they'd say, oh, well, if your mom has blue eyes, it's little b, little b, and if your dad has brown eyes, it could be big b, little b, because the little b, blue, is recessive, and they show you all the potential ways that you could get blue eye kids with a 
brown-eyed dad and a blue-eyed mom. And that's all cute and it's fun and it's simply, it's simple. Uh, however, when you move on in biology, you come to a place where the teacher says, no, 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 you got to forget everything you were told. You got to forget all that stuff about the simple little four chart, four areas on a chart to figure out eye color. Like it's way more complicated than that. I remember the same thing in chemistry class, eighth grade chem. So much fun learning about electrons and, and how uh, different uh, things come together and, and make new uh, new elements and, and stuff can work together and uh, like hydrogen and oxygen can come together and it does something with the with the electrons and it makes H2O, right? And it's all this fun stuff. And then you get to 11th grade chemistry and the first thing our teacher told us, forget everything you learn in 8th grade chemistry, it's not even right, right? It's, a, it's an overly simplistic way of understanding that's only going to keep you back, only going to hold you back from learning the what we really think we know about chemistry. Hmm. Or maybe cryptocurrencies. Maybe you're confused by them. You're like, I'm never going to put money into that. Or maybe you're all into it, right? But it's a new thing. What is our response going to be if we can't let go of cash? We can't quite understand what is this crypto thing all about? Or even sports. You know what? It's a blast to go back and look at some sports games from like the 1950s and compare it to sports now. Some of these sports like basketball, it doesn't even look like the same game. Ice hockey, you're like, what did they used to play? They called that hockey? What? What is that? Or even football players, you look at the, the plays they used to, to run or the lack of plays that they used to run or even new systems or, right? Things are changing. If we're holding on to the old, we're probably not appreciating or receiving the new. Right? We're liable to miss the new. And you know what? The same thing can happen spiritually. It can happen with God. Now, thankfully, we have the book of John to help us out, to keep us straight. And it's full of accounts and details to make sure we don't miss what God is doing, that we don't miss these new things that he has done. So let's dive back in together. Grab your Bibles. Turn to John chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 to 12. And as I do, I want you to listen specifically for details. John is a master writer of including details and also of leaving details out. So it's a great exercise when you're reading scripture, but and particularly John, look at the details. Identify the details that he's sharing. Identify the things that he's kind of leaving vague or, or not explaining because all these things kind of are helping to tell the narrative that he's telling about Jesus. So I'm going to ask some questions after we're done reading. Um, so follow along here. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. It says this, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants, they did know where it came from, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Oh, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you... You have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. His disciples believed in him. And then this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And they stayed there for a few days. So there's a lot of details there, right? What, what, what are some of the details that you heard or that you saw as you followed along John sharing in this short little 12 verse account of Jesus turning water into wine. Maybe, maybe you notice that, that, well, he says that they're at a wedding, but you know, strangely, he doesn't actually say who's getting married. 
uh, offers no details about the wedding ceremony, what connection Jesus and his mother and the disciples had with the bride or the groom. Like, we don't have any of those details. Um, it, it's kind of like when, when I talk to somebody and I find out um, they're getting married or they're having a baby or they had a baby. And, and then I go and I tell my wife and I say, oh, yeah, you know, this person had a baby. And, and she wants all the details. Well, how big was it? How long was it? How how uh, how long is it? Not was it? Is it? How long is the baby? How 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 heavy is the baby? And and what's all these things? And I'm like, I I, I don't know. I didn't ask those questions, right? John's kind of like that. He doesn't have those. If you want to know the details of the wedding, you're, you're gonna have to wait. Sorry, we don't know how many people came. We don't know what kind of uh, decorations were used. We we don't know any of that. John doesn't share it, right? Simple example of how he uh, shares some details but keeps some details out. You know, it's fascinating. Do you notice he doesn't say the name of Jesus' mother? He just refers to her always as the mother of Jesus. No name, just the mother of Jesus. Um, Do you notice that he also made a point to say it was the third day? It's interesting, right? It was the third day when Jesus turned this water into wine. Uh, it says we ran out of wine, but we don't know why. Um, we don't know. Uh, typically, um, there is uh, the wedding celebration lasts up to a week. Now, was that third day, uh, meaning the third day of the wedding, or was it just on the third day of him being in Cana? There was a uh, a wedding that they were at. Like, why'd they run out of wine? How how far into this? ceremony are they right these details that are there and sort of not there um do you notice jesus answers his mother not as mom but woman that's interesting right it's a strange little detail that john keeps and and then we get this really pretty elaborate description in in this um these words from the master of the feast after he drinks this new wine that Jesus uh, turned from from the water, right? And he and we get a lot of dialogue of his, fascinatingly large amount for a small set of verses. He gets a, a good section, and we find from this that the first wine is called poor, or at least it's referred to as poor, and the second wine, the wine that Jesus turned from water, it's called good. Right? He said, no, no, you've kept the good wine until now. Well, that was the wine that Jesus changed from water. Now, here's, I personally do not believe any of these details were, were left out or added in by accident. Right? I believe it was, it was on purpose, divinely instructed on purpose. Right? It's John's way of showing what's really important is he was looking back and thinking and praying and discerning with the Holy Spirit. What, what should we write in this gospel? Right? This is all intentional. It's not by accident. And the, and the detail I really want to focus on all morning here, the rest of this time, is verse 6. Right? It's a fascinating detail that he includes here. I'm going to read it again for you. It says, Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now, you might be thinking, Chris, of all the details that are in there, why is this one the most important? Right, well, I'm going to ask you some more questions again, so I hope you're ready. What were these water jars there for? Do you remember? Turn and say it to somebody. Say it out loud. I, I don't know if I can hear you or not, or obviously I can't hear you. Um, won't be here. You can type it into the chat screen if you're watching this as the uh, first time uh, that we uh, put it out there on YouTube. But what were they used for, right? Why were these water jars there? John tells us. This is one of the details he includes, right? He says for Jewish rites of purification. That's what they're there for. They're for Jewish rites of purification. Okay, and what is the reason something needs purified? Right? What's the reason something needs purified? Again, turn and tell someone who you're sitting next to. Talk to me on the screen, even though I can't hear you. Type it into the chat screen if you're watching this on the premiere. Why does something need purified? Well, because it's not clean. It's dirty. It's contaminated. Right? It, that's why something needs purified. And so um, 
There's six jars, right? We saw there's six, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. So I'm gonna just estimate 25 as a good easy number to work with. If there's six of them, they hold 25 gallons. That's 150 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Uh, why do you think so much water would be needed at a wedding? Well, presumably, so that there's enough for everyone who needs to purify themselves uh, at this event, at this ceremony. Right, whatever that looked like, these rites that they were following. So they had 150 gallons worth of water to do these purification rites. But you know what? That just brings up another question for me. Why would they need to be purified? Right, don't you think the majority of the people here would have been purified at some point previously before the wedding? Uh, somewhere along the lines, they would have done something been a part of some feast, some religious ceremony where they would have been required to be purified. I think that's a pretty good as assumption that we could say, yeah, probably most of these attendees were at some point already purified. Um, so then why do they need to be purified again? What If you're purified once, why would you need to be purified again? Well, because the Jewish rites of purification could not purify permanently. Right? That's the big thing here. But here's the thing. Something new happened. This is what John wants us to get. Something very important happened to the water in these vessels. Right? Remember, Jesus tells them, grab those jars. Those jars used for Jewish rites of purification fill them up with water. And so they do, right? These servants, they listen, they fill them up. He then tells them to draw some out and take it to the master, which they do. They listen, they obey. And that water that was drawn out became wine and not just any wine, right? Wine so good. It was wine that was so good that the master of the feast stopped everything, it seems like, and says, everybody stop. Stop the dancing, stop the celebrating, stop the chatter, stop everything. I got something to say. I got to tell you how good this new wine is. Now, did you catch what John wanted you to see in that? Right? God is doing this new thing, and it has to do with being purified has to do with being cleansed, with having our stains removed permanently. See, a better way is being revealed, one that is permanent, one that is lasting. Here's how the author of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews 9, verses 11 to 14. It says this, But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all the holy places, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, right, or Jewish rites purification, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, but not permanently, temporarily, right? How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Right, so this good wine, it's a foreshadow event of the blood of Jesus, right? The blood of his sacrifice on the cross and how his blood alone makes us clean, makes us pure, you and me, permanently. All right, so what does this mean to you and me? Well, first, it means that if you believe in Jesus, if you follow him, if you surrender to him as Lord and King, then his blood has already purified you. You are clean, you are pure, you are made new. But here's the thing, like we get tripped up on this a lot. And there's a reason for it. I still make mistakes. You're going to still make mistakes. And, and when we do, we can be tempted to turn back to the old wine, right? The old wine, which signified this uh, religion, the rites of purification to try to make ourselves 
clean. It's like trying to use your computer with Windows 95 in that Zoom meeting. It's just not going to work. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get upset. You're going to get a you're going to want to quit. You're going to want to stop at some point. Right? Stay away from that old wine. Turn to the new wine, the blood of Jesus. Now maybe you're thinking, "Yeah, Chris, you don't know what I've done." You don't know what I'm thinking. You don't know what I'm stuck in currently, the rut in my life, the 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 pain that I've caused, the pain that I continue to cause. And you're right, I don't. But you know what I do know? I know that God's grace is abundant enough to take care of that. How do I know that? Well, it says it here. Right? Where does it say it? Well, remember back to that 150 gallon, the six jars, 20 to 30? Well, that was all turned to wine. What is that showing us? Think about that for a moment. 150 gallons of wine at a wedding? Yeah, there's plenty for everyone, right? More than enough for everyone. Abundantly enough for everyone. And that's what John wants us to see here. It's a picture of God's grace. Abundance. This new wine that's that's poured out freely, right? It's a symbol of his grace. So yeah, I don't know maybe what you've done or what you're thinking or, or what you're currently stuck in, but I do know God's grace is enough, more than enough to, to get you out of that, to clean you up, to make you new as well. And you know what? It, this doesn't happen um, from us making more promises to God. Oh God, just help me out this one time and I promise I'll never do this again. Just get me out of this jam and I promise I'll never do this again, right? Promises don't do it. That's an old religion. That's the old wine, the new wine. We get there, not by making more promises, but by making more confessions. That's how we tap into this new wine, this wine of God's grace, by confessing our sins to God and to one another, as the Bible says. And when we do those things, he'll freely forgive us. That's what the Bible says. That's what this whole picture John is painting here in this chapter two of his, of his wonderful uh, biography on Jesus. That's what he's showing us. You know what, friends? Sometimes the best thing we can do for each other is to remind each other of this new wine this grace that's available only in Christ. And so if you're a follower, if you're a believer, you use that new wine through confession. So be confessing. Confess to God. Confess to each other. Shower each other with the grace that God gives us. Watch what happens when we do. Now maybe some of us, we've never accepted Jesus. We haven't received this new wine. Well, here's my question for you. What's keeping you? Right? All other ways of purifying, of cleaning, we're just going to become dirty again. Nothing else that we know of can keep us clean except the blood of Jesus. So stop wasting your time. Turn to Jesus to be healed, to be cleansed, to be purified. So here's my last question for you this morning. I know it's been a lot of me asking you questions, but here's my last one for you this morning. Which wine are you currently drinking? The old or the new? Are you following a system of religious activity to try to make yourself clean? Or are you turning to Christ, trusting in his work, believing in him, and then following him? Here's my, uh, here's my word of encouragement. Go for the new wine. Go for that new wine of Christ, the blood of Jesus, the one that uh, the author of Hebrews says cleans our conscience so that we can now serve the living God. I guarantee you it will be a decision you never regret. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this awesome reminder of your grace, of your love, of your goodness. And I pray for everyone who's watching this, that regardless of, of what their past is or even what their present situation might be, they would turn to you, to trust in your grace, to surrender to you as Lord and King, to obey you in the same way that these servants did who saw this amazing miracle. May they also obey you in walking with you in life, trusting in you. And as they do, 
drinking this new wine that you and you alone give. Let their conscience be cleansed. Let their let them, uh, minds and their hearts be purified and lead them into newness of life as only you can. God, be greatly glorified in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, I want to thank you for joining this morning, and I want to send you with this blessing. May God the Father bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, and may he cover you with his grace each and every day. Go and be blessed.